But now we need to move on to sound waves. So this is taking forward, I suppose, everything that we've, uh, we've done in, in generic terms. Uh, and now we're going to look at this in the particular context <coughs> of vibrations in, um, uh, well, mostly in air, although, of course, any, any material will do it. And that's actually all we need. We need a medium, a physical medium through which these pressure waves can travel. But this is our classic diagram, and this, I suppose, you could think about as a speaker cone, um, which is just moving backwards and forwards, depending on the frequency of the um, current that's being applied uh, within the cone. And it's just going to push gas molecules one way, or uh, they're going to fall back towards it as the cone moves back. So it's going to produce high-pressure zones, low pressure zones, depending on whether the cone's moving forward or backwards. All right, so we get these wave fronts where we've got compression <coughs> moving through, uh, and then we get you know, the, the trough in our sinusoidal wave is essentially this low pressure zone in between. Uh, now, somewhere here, I think I had... Yeah. <coughs> We've seen this before, right at the very beginning, when we looked at the difference between longitudinal and transverse waves. All right, now remember what we've got. You can look at any of these markers up here if it, if it helps. All we've got is displacements parallel to the direction of the wave front, of the wave fronts moving in. All right, so all they're doing is oscillating backwards and forwards. All right, now if... This will be quite useful in a couple of slides' time if you note this. But you, if you note that when the displacement of these marker particles is zero, in other words, when they go through the midpoint, their equilibrium point in their oscillation, we're either talking about a region of maximum pressure, maximum density, or we're talking about a region of minimum pressure, minimum density. Right, I'm just pointing that out because it will make reading the graph that we're going to see in a little while uh, maybe a little bit more meaningful. Right, you you could have be able to derive this for yourselves later on, but looking at it visually might be helpful. All right, so that's our sound wave. It is just a pressure wave. It is just a longitudinal motion of particles. Uh, and we can describe it in all sorts of different ways. This is, again, a variant of the theme. This is a piston moving in a tube, so basically it's producing high-pressure regions. When the piston moves back, it's producing low-pressure <coughs> regions. So, surprise, surprise, if we increase the pressure, we're providing a bit of additional um, momentum in the forward direction for our air molecules. Right, they travel forwards, they collide with other air molecules, which transfers that motion onwards and so on. Right? All they're doing as an individual molecule, all it's doing is oscillating back and forth. But in that process, we're transferring this pressure wave forwards. Right? And likewise, when the cone's moving backwards and we're getting low pressure, we'll get gas molecules moving back to fill that low pressure zone. Right, and that's giving us our return motion of the gas molecules. And this thing will just progress as a pressure wave uh, through the medium. And we can plot our sound wave in all sorts of different ways. Right, so we can do it by density. That's not going to surprise you greatly. So if we have a compression here, we've got maximum density in our air. Uh, it will go through its equilibrium value. We get maximum in terms of rarefaction, so low pressure uh, region, back through equilibrium to high pressure again, a complete cycle in the motion of our gas molecules. Pressure, of course, will track density. Higher the density of the gas, the higher the pressure. That's pretty much by definition. Uh, the displacement, however, is, is somewhat different, you'll notice, and that's why I wanted you to focus on one of those marker particles in the animation we just looked at. Uh, because actually the maximum and the minimum in terms of pressure and density coincides with our equilibrium uh, positions. Yeah? Um, and if we've got a displacement, 
then to get the velocity of our gas molecules, that's trivial, right? You just differentiate the displacement with respect to time. You've done that calculus already. So you would expect that if we had a sine curve, for instance, describing our displacement, we get the cosine describing the velocity. Right? We just differentiate the sine to get a cosine. And so this curve is actually shifting by 90 degrees compared to the other one. We can actually differentiate that again, get the acceleration of our gas molecules if we wanted to. And in fact, we'll go on and do this when we start thinking towards the end of the module about simple harmonic motion. So we differentiate the velocity then and we get the acceleration of our particles in whatever sound wave this is or whatever wave this is. But this is the first step. If this is our displacement as a function of distance along uh, the piston tube here, then uh, velocity is just going to be differentiating that with respect to time, which is precisely what you do to change from displacement to velocity. I don't think this says anything uh, that I haven't said already. It's there to reinforce, I suppose, the, the words. Um, we're going to make this assumption that all of our pressure waves as they move out are going to have equal amplitude. All right, so we're making an assumption at this stage that we have no friction in our system. It, we can add that in later if we want to, but for now, <coughs> let's keep it simple and straightforward. So we don't get a loss of amplitude at this stage. Right at the very end of the module, I will tell you about damping forces. But for now, we don't need to worry about those too much. Um, and of course, this generic thing that we've talked about already, these phase relationships, exactly the same uh, for this system that we're talking about now as, uh, as before. Yeah? So all the generic stuff is carrying forwards, basically. Um, now, I put this slide in because it reminded me very much of a, of a demonstration of this that I saw many, many, many years ago, sadly, way before YouTube, so I can't even point you to the... Um, <coughs> of it. But I remember seeing uh, on TV a couple of um, guys, and I think they happened to be German guys, but they were into uh, really heavy rock, and they could determine which particular uh, song they were listening to purely by the bass notes of the song. And they didn't do it by listening to the bass line, they were actually put into a, you know, a a, a room, as it were, remote from where the sound was being played, they simply looked at a candle flame put in front of the loudspeaker cap. So from the flicker of the candle flame, just because of the pressure waves coming off the speaker cap, they could reconstruct in their heads the bass line, and between the two of them, they had, I think they were played ten different tracks, and they got absolutely every one right. So, you know, how to spend your time before <coughs> World of Warcraft appears on the internet. You learn the bass lines of records by the flicker that it creates in a flame in front of the speaker. Anyway, that's why it's in there. But it's essentially a diagram showing exactly the same thing. All right? So this, if you like, is a crude measure uh, of what's happening in terms of, you know, which direction of the air molecule is moving in. Uh, so, you know, we're going to assume at this point that we've got equilibrium, as it were. Um, and again, a plot of the displacement, excuse me, <coughs> of our air molecules <coughs> and the associated variation of pressure. All right, now, we can get sound through any, any physical system. We do just need a medium for it to travel through. Uh, so we can produce sound uh, in this wooden bench, for instance. All right, if I tap the bench, it'll come out wonderfully on the webcam. Uh, I've got a sound wave traveling through the bench. Well, that's not what you heard, of course. You heard that being transferred into the air and then to your ears. But you will have you will have detected sound waves in that way. Uh, you know, if you feel vibrations in a, in a wooden floor, for instance, so a typical dance floor is, is going to be a sprung timber floor, uh, and vibrations travel really very well in that. 
Uh, I can remember going to a hi-fi fair when I was mid-teens, I suppose, in Earl's Court. Uh, f absolutely phenomenal sound system, such that you could feel the bass line of the music in your sternum. It would actually cause, you know, I could detect it in my ribcage. Um, which is probably why my hearing is so rubbish now. But, uh, you know, that was, that was definitely true. Uh, yeah, I also went to one of the early concerts given by Queen, actually, before they'd had their first number one. Um, just after, sorry, they were booked before. Uh, and it was just after their first number one. And uh, they just spent huge amounts of money, of the, all this new money they got on a sound system. And it was in a very small venue, right? Because it was booked when they weren't that famous. And uh, an entire wall was covered in speakers, basically. And I don't think there was anybody in there that could stay in the room for more than two songs. Um, and it was all to do with pressure waves, of course, wrecking our bodies. And we had to go outside and let the ringing in your ears decay away before going back in again. Great evening, though. Anyway, <coughs> anything that's connected as a solid or a liquid or a gas by interatomic, intermolecular forces of any sort, however weak, and we know they're weak in air, uh, will nevertheless transmit sound. So if we look at some of the speeds, uh, the wave speeds associated with different materials, you can see they vary quite a lot. Um, and they vary in a way that you know, it's not always straightforward. There's a basic trend uh, from gas through solid to liquids. The wave speed is going up, you'll notice. Uh, but within that, there's, there's things that don't necessarily seem as obvious as they might. Uh, you know, why is it that the wave speed in helium is so much higher than the wave speed in air? That, by the way, is the reason why uh, your voice will sound high-pitched if you speak after filling the lungs with helium. It's because the wave speed has changed. Uh, if you breathe in helium, you'll notice your voice will be <coughs> even higher pitched still. This is not something I'm recommending for you to do at home. Uh, but definitely would happen. Right? Uh, and you'll know that deep sea divers actually have a mix of oxygen and uh, helium, and in some cases hydrogen. Uh, and that will affect uh, their, um, their voice pitch. Uh, put sound through water and it changes. Actually, you know, it even changes the temperature, you'll notice. Uh, in fact, it changes quite a lot, the temperature in water. Just from 0 to 20 degrees, uh, the speed of sound has changed quite appreciably, easily measurable. Uh, and in seawater, it's much higher still. <coughs> Uh, in solids, the speed goes way up, and this wouldn't surprise you too much. All right? The bonding between um, atoms and molecules in a solid is much more rigid than it is in a liquid, and certainly than in a gas. So the transfer of energy between, between you know, one set of molecules that you've started vibrating and the, those around them uh, is going to be that much more efficient. So sound, uh, the sound. Um, uh, speed, sound wave speed, will go up accordingly. And these, remember, are the sort of things we were looking at in terms of refraction in the Earth, right? That's just a component of the upper crust of the Earth. But you can imagine now that if you added uh, water into granite, it became wet rock, you get a slightly different sound speed. Or if you had oil deposits, Again, you get different wave speeds and therefore different refraction effects uh, to waves passing through. And this stuff's all incredibly valuable. 